Hailed as a Final Fantasy for fans and first-timers, Final Fantasy XV is the most recent mainline entry in the storied JRPG series run by Square Enix. No, not that one. Personally, I've only ever beaten two games in the mainline series, those of course being Final Fantasy X and now XV. One could argue that X2 should also be considered as part of the main entries given that it is a direct sequel to a main entry, but for the sake of consistency, I'm not one of those people. Having said that, these two aren't the only ones that I've played, just the only ones that I've beaten. I say this more for context than anything else, and since this is my video, it's not like anyone can stop me. 15 is an open-world action RPG featuring Noctis in his journeys to get married. At first. Things kind of veer away from that point very quickly, but given the kind of game it is, it's not necessarily a surprise, is it? Real question is, how did it turn out? Final Fantasy XV began its life in development as Final Fantasy vs. XIII. Yeah, this game, which came out in 2016, began development in 2006 as a side story within the so-called Fabula Nova Crystallis series of games, alongside other titles like Final Fantasy Type-0 and, as you might have guessed, Final Fantasy XIII. This subset of games, apart from sharing the Final Fantasy moniker, shared some similar themes as well as a focus on crystals, surprising no one, and specific deities tied to those crystals. While this to some degree would change, you can still see some of those connections within the game and its story. Around six years later, upon the reveal of the at-the-time next-gen PS4 and Xbox One, the change to being a mainline title became official and with it, a number of key changes. Characters and elements were added and removed as needed, and even the director was replaced, as well as, apparently, a complete shuffling of the development teams and starting development entirely over. Despite the development hell, though, it's still considered to be one of the most best-selling Final Fantasy games ever, with over 10 million copies sold. There were some not at all surprising names and companies tied to the title as well, those including Yoshitaka Amano and Visual Works. Alongside the game was released something titled the Final Fantasy XV Universe, a series of multimedia tie-ins that were pushed out either alongside the title or released sometime around its launch. Importantly, it's considered that two specific things within the Final Fantasy XV Universe, King's Glaive and Brotherhood, are actually considered to be, well, important. I'll be getting back to those later in the story section, but it would be dishonest of me not to mention their existence here in the history section. Just expect more details later on. And here's something interesting, though. You can play the entirety of Final Fantasy XV on your phone. I don't mean those cutscene movie videos on YouTube, either. I mean the game itself. Well, it won't look nearly as good, and likely won't control at all the same, but it does exist in the form of Final Fantasy XV Pocket Edition as released on iOS and Android. Originally released in 2018, it eventually came to consoles being retitled as Final Fantasy XV Pocket Edition HD, because they really needed to get that HD in there. I'll admit I'm at least somewhat disappointed in the game's presentation. Not because it's bad, but because there isn't that much variety, and where there is variety, it isn't used to its fullest extent. 15 is an urban fantasy world, which is to say a world with modern technological advancements like cell phones, but it also has magic and other various fantasy elements like actual gods and monsters. You don't really see these two deferring facets of the game's reality intersect that often, if at all. I'll be bringing it up a bit more later, but Accordo wouldn't need magic to exist. Lestalem kind of does, but actually seeing it wouldn't give you that idea. It's like this more or less anywhere you go, where it seems these two sides of the world are constantly held apart from each other. And when they do meet, the effects are so minuscule that it may as well not have occurred in the first place. That's, again, not to say that the open world is visually ugly. It is very scenic, and something of a feast for the eyes, especially when you're traveling around in the regalia, but it lacks nearly anything that screams that this is truly an urban fantasy world. There are landmarks that are interesting, but they stand out that much more because they are so few and far between. If you know anything about this game, chances are you've seen the previously mentioned Accordo, a city which is obviously inspired by the real-world Venice. It is the only city that sticks out in my mind as being interesting to inhabit, and you're only really there once throughout the entire story, which makes it even more disappointing to note. The Stalem, you'd think with its focus on the Disk of Kothis and the meteor fragments that literally powered the city, and the fact that only women work there is still 
not as interesting as any of that buildup could suggest, though you at least visit it more than once in the story, unlike Accordo. You never really get to see or visit Insomnia, the loosest crown city, until the very end of the game, at which point it's just not appealing to visit in the state that you eventually see it in through events relating to the story. Despite that, it shouldn't be surprising to note that the music is good, but the sound design is especially interesting. This is 100% like definitely nostalgia talking, but it reminds me of the road trips my family would take every summer on our way to visit family. For the most part, you can justify using speakers as a primary audio output, but in this case, the game greatly benefits from using headphones headphones over that, even if you don't use the regalius radio while traveling around. There's a genuine soundscape here that's nice to hear. Now's your chance, Noct. Close in from behind. And remember, we need to- Insomnia... falls. What? This is your idea of a joke? I need you to calm down so I can explain. I'm as calm as I'm gonna get! That team can skin a fish alive. Pulling away from a bite only means... So, the moral of the story is don't get it. Submerged. Uh, it does seem harder to breathe. Let's be done with this. Not the time for horseplay. Nothing to it. Not too shabby. FF15 follows Prince Noctis of the Kingdom of Lucis the last of the royalty's line on his way to get married to Lady Luna Freya, the world's oracle, essentially someone who talks to the gods on the behalf of mankind. This doesn't work out since the Empire of Niflheim launches an assault on Lucis, killing the king and claiming that both Lady Luna Freya and Prince Noctis have died at a so-called peace treaty signing. Obviously, as you may have noticed, you're in fact not dead, so the agenda quickly changes from getting married to gathering power. Which is literal, by the way, not some political get allies for some kind of counterattack situation, although I probably would have played that game too. Noctis, alongside three of his friends, those being Ignis, Gladiolus, and Prompto, have to find and gather power from royal tombs scattered across the world, since, as it turns out, the Lucis bloodline that Noctis carries has been irrevocably tied to the crystal, and he in turn must act as, among other things, its defender. It does have some issues, though, and by it I mean the story. The game doesn't really do a good job of setting up its, well, its setting. There have been a few instances where I was just lost, whether due to characters dumping exposition on me as if I'm supposed to know what it means, or plot-relevant story reveals that tie to information that I likewise didn't know. There is a makeshift solution, however, in the form of readable tidbits of information scattered all across the world, and the game even knows that this is a problem since on first launching the game and playing it, it says, hey, you might want to check out this stuff over here in the tutorial to really solidify your understanding. The so-called lore guide. The problem also has some remedies outside of the game, in the form of the Final Fantasy XV universe. Remember when EA at one point in time wanted like all of their intellectual property to be these multimedia franchises with books like Mass Effect Ascension, something which I know shit actually wrote a book report on for a school project, and anime movies like Dead Space Downfall? I don't think I could have gotten away with doing a project on that one. Square, it seems, had a similar idea. True, they already had things like Advent Children and Last Order for Final Fantasy VII in the past, but those were additions to a complete story released nearly a decade after that story finished. And even then, it wasn't quite like what happened with XV here. You've got Kingsglaive, a frankly fantastic looking CGI film that takes place during the Peace Treaty signings events. There's also Brotherhood, a free-to-watch anime series focusing on the main characters 
and how their relationships with Noctis began. The Platinum demo was equal parts a demo and another of many canonical prologues to the events in 15, taking place when Noctis is a child. There was an audio drama titled Prologue Parting Ways that takes place the day before Noctis leaves. A King's Tale is a fictionalized story that Regis tells his son Noctis and is also a side-scrolling game. I'm sure you've noticed the prologue precedent here as if to suggest there was a lot of information that was either knowingly or circumstantially left out of the base game. And it should be noted, this isn't even all of them. This is just what I'm mentioning here. They even retroactively added in parts of scenes from Kingsglaive to better explain and showcase some events in the game. Some of these are free and thus arguably justifiable to get your hands on in order to really understand more about the world, but that's not the case for all of them. Sure, you might be like me and find a copy of Kingsglaive in a bargain bin somewhere, but not everyone is so lucky to get their semi-required reading on a random Tuesday walking home. It just doesn't feel right is what I mean. And it also shouldn't be that the solution is at least partially found outside of the game itself. Dark Souls and games like it can get away with that kind of obfuscating storytelling and approach to setting because those games are already naturally inclined towards that kind of storytelling to begin with by the nature of the game and the gameplay itself. I mean, in Dark Souls alone, you're just some pseudo-undead idiot. You don't know much, if anything, about the world outside because your character in all likelihood doesn't either. In Final Fantasy XV, you play the prince to a kingdom with all that entails. There has to be some better way than what was actually done. It's not as if the game doesn't have a character that can exposit all over Noctis either. Now I've got the Windows version through Steam, which comes with a few things. I'm mentioning this for a reason, by the way. But firstly, it comes with episodes Gladiolus, Ignis, and Prompto, as well as the optional free 4K resolution pack, and Companions multiplayer DLC. In addition, there's also the Mod Organizer and Bonus Half-Life pack. The episodes, as well as the Companions DLC, contribute to the main story by providing extra details for events that Noctis isn't directly involved with, but that you can see the direct effects of while playing through the main game. It's semi-side content. It isn't necessary, strictly speaking, but it does feel like it was meant to be there to begin with, sans Companions, since that doesn't feel nearly as plot-relevant as the episodes. Thankfully, with this version of the game, it's packaged into it, and thus not an extra price tag to consider if you want the full story. There is a catch to the Half-Life pack, however, in that it isn't included in the game itself. It's a mod. Uh, technically, it's a collection of five different mods published by the Final Fantasy XV official Steam account. I don't know why it wasn't included in the game itself, especially given that it is advertised as something you claim when buying it. Not included, but available at a $5 price tag, is Episode Arden. It's like the other episodes, not strictly speaking, necessary, but doesn't feel quite like an addition either. Past that, and especially the Half-Life tangent, I wasn't expecting to do that in a Final Fantasy reveal, the basic theme of Brotherhood is felt all throughout the story, since it focuses on the relationship between those four friends of Noctis, Ignis, Gladiolus, and Prompto. Noctis, of course, is the Prince of Lucis and the protagonist that you control. Ignis is kind of his steward and advisor, acting as the voice of reason for the group and was raised with that goal in mind. Gladiolus is a effectively a bodyguard from a long line of bodyguards, sworn to protect Lucis royalty. It's a trait and family tradition he takes great pride in. Prompto is Noctis' best friend, whom he met as a teenager. Unlike the other three, Prompto doesn't have any kind of responsibility garnered onto him as a result of nobility or something akin to it. The entire story thrives on the backbone of these four friends and their adventures to get Noctis to where he rightfully belongs. And honestly, it's good. It's a road trip to remember, and the characters emphasize that premise even further further. The only real issue I have with it, at least relating to the main story, is pacing. You're gonna feel some some serious whiplash with the pacing and it's something. Lies. Like that ceasefire. I would like to start this section off by stating that I couldn't help but notice a number of visual bugs and glitches of varying sizes, some of which I unfortunately can't really showcase due to spoilers. Obviously, as with any kind of visual issue, your mileage may vary, but it's worth noting that they did happen, which is a shame since the game looks good without them in terms of fidelity at the absolute least. Especially during those pre-rendered CGI cutscenes, those look astoundingly great as long as you ignore the stuttering that can happen. There's a weapon, most specifically a ring, that you can use towards the end of the game that seems to have an issue with lock-on. It'll lock on to enemies pretty easily. 
it's supposed to. That's how lock-on is designed. But then the camera seems to itself lock into facing a random direction, which normally doesn't have that monster. You'll just be facing somewhere that you can't easily define as helpful. I also dealt with one crash throughout my entire playtime at the beginning of chapter 9. It wasn't something I could replicate though, so maybe I was just unlucky. This next one is a bit more of a personal gripe. The open world itself isn't all that interesting mechanically. And there's some genuinely interesting dungeons you can come across, and some of the overworld's fights incorporate aspects of the open world into them in intriguing ways, but most of the side quests boil down to glorified fetch quests, which in turn renders the exploration of the open world that this game very adamantly advertises altogether lackluster. The overarching gameplay itself is interesting in that it is this semi-active thing. And it's kind of frustrating to me, if I'm being honest. To attack, you hold a button. To defend or dodge, you also hold a button. Even when the prompt on screen would make you believe you need to press it. And then, when the parry prompt appears, don't hold it. Press it. If you're grabbed, press it repeatedly, even though, again, it looks like you're supposed to hold. Warp Strike is aiming at an enemy, locking on, and pressing. Warp Points are aiming at a designated point, not locking on, and holding. You're getting the sense that I don't like this because I largely don't. I think this is just how I feel about it personally. The prompts are misleading though, for sure, and altogether it's largely inconsistent as a result. This next one isn't actually personal. Even the summons that the Final Fantasy series is known for don't really help the feeling that the game could almost literally play itself, since outside of two story-specific moments, they can only be summoned entirely at random. You don't get to choose when you can use some of the game's coolest abilities. That's just bad. That is bad design. I assume the slimming down of your capabilities in combat is done for the sake of appearances, since the combat is very flashy. But in terms of engagement, I'm not actually doing that much beyond holding a button down and changing the directions of my attack. This would be significantly cooler if all of it weren't so easy to actually pull off. Any attempt to spice that up is the tech bar, a resource that allows you to activate active abilities from each of your companions or Noctis himself, and Armiger, which unlocks through story progression and is separate from the tech bar and only Noctis can use. But even using these in conjunction with each other and the combat loop in general isn't as engaging as I would like. Still pissed about the fucking summons though, that's just bad. Outside combat, you've got your standard open world elements like resource gathering and map clearing. Among the resources you'll find are various draw points that allow you to gather up magical elements. Admittedly, when I first saw this mentioned in the lead-up to the game's release, I immediately thought of Final Fantasy VIII's drawing and junction system. But it's not nearly as all-encompassing as that was. For a start, you can only draw three kinds of elements, those being fire, ice, and lightning. You also need a magic flask to create your spells. You can craft them in the elements you screen, and you can mix and match these elements as you please to increase their potency or potentially change their effects. You can also choose a single item and dictate the amount of that item to add into the flask as well, which further modifies the resulting spell. That is it, though. That is beginning, middle, end. There's no extra effects you can pull from enemies or for whatever reason. I, I don't remember if it's ever explained in 8, but you can't pull cards from monsters here. Nor can you inexplicably tie them to your stats. Combat and Exploration both make use of the Ascension Tree, which is this leveling tree that expends the AP or action points you gain. It augments a few things, including granting new combat capabilities and increasing how much AP you gain from various tasks, though you will want the upgrades to your companion's various skills. Noctis can fish, which allows him to catch what Ignis can cook. Helping scrounge up things post-combat and in the wild is Gladiolus with his survival skills and making sure to keep these memories in mind and in hand is Prompto with his photography. As for the maps, there's actually a really easy way to spot things on it without manually walking or driving all over the place until their little blips pop up on the map. Talking to people. There are various restaurants that have tipsters as they're called that can highlight various points of interest on the map when you talk to them. They also offer up food, it is a restaurant after all, and contracts for monsters to hunt. These contracts offer up money and experience, and as you do them, your hunter rank increases and opens up more contracts for you to do. The food offers temporary bonuses to various stats depending on the food you eat. You'll also come across various spots of interest that offer parking, places to rest, and spots to rent chocobos, not to mention the various shops scattered across the land and dungeons that on occasion have requirements to open up. One of the most important aspects of the map are camping spots. Areas where you can, surprise, surprise, set up camp. 
This allows you to do a few things. For starters, Ignis can cook here. You can also train with Gladio or simply pass time on the chance that a contract requires you beat creatures that only come out at certain hours of the day. In order to level up at all, you need to rest at either a resting location like an inn or at a camp, but both provide separate bonuses. You can't cook with Ignis at an inn, but resting at an inn can provide an experience bonus you can't get at a camp. It should be known that this experience bonus, when used in conjunction with various kinds of food, can make leveling, ironically, one of the easiest things that you can do in the game. To justifiably travel across the countryside requires more than just your feet, however. I've already mentioned chocobos, which, after rental, you can call at nearly any point via a chocobo whistle, but there's also the regalia, your customizable four-wheeled ride. This customization goes beyond appearances, by the way, if you can find its various upgrades. Thankfully, you don't need an upgrade to buy from it. The regalia also doubles as a portable shop right out of the gate. The options aren't as extensive as the shops you can find in towns or points of interest at first, but it's nice that you can quick stock on potions and the like in a pinch. The regalia also takes fuel, so that's a factor you will have to keep an eye on. In order to experience the open world to its fullest extent, however, you will have to go through the main story since it opens up more of that open world as you progress. Now, I wouldn't suggest worrying too much about points of no return. Firstly, because the game literally points out, with big old text boxes, when you're about to enter a point in the story where you won't be able to exit for some time something you will notice increasingly often as you continue through the story, since it is very linear. Secondly, after some time in the story, you gain access to Umbra. Umbra is your faithful canine companion, and he can travel through time. You can call him up at any rest point to fast travel to other points in the storyline without losing your progress wherever you were prior to the time traveling. You can also call him up just to shake his little paw. I think he's confused by that one. Having said that, there are definitely some side quests and quest lines you will want to do and complete as soon as you can. A better Engine Blade and Frogs of Legend both have rewards that are just great, though the latter is more annoying to achieve and neither are strictly speaking necessary. They just have neat rewards. Into Unknown Frontiers, similarly, is only available in Chapter 15, but it ends really well. It ends with just, just good. Just good. Made available in Chapter 3, Friends of a Feather and the immediate follow-up hunt, a behemoth undertaking, are nearly essential, since they, spoilers, unlock the ability to rent chocobos. Unfortunately, most of the side quests are largely disappointing, for the reasons I admittedly briefly touched on earlier. A lot of them feel like fetch quests, for better or for worse. None of them compared to the hell that chapter 13 was, though. What a fucking mess. Of the points you can have Umber take you to in dealing with side quests you missed or intentionally ignored, whichever the case may be, there are 14 chapters in total. Technically 15, but the 15th chapter is more of a proper free-roaming open-world epilogue that has the world as open as it can feasibly be. In addition, a lot of the most challenging and potentially rewarding content, mostly in the forms of combat and dungeon delving, is hidden away in that final chapter. It is, again, a post-game open-world exploration in a world that is unfortunately largely lacking in engaging side content. Oh, wait, actually, important, seriously, don't chapter select chapter 15 when you have it unlocked from the game's main menu after you beat the game. Instead, load your post-game save and then use Umbra to travel to chapter 15. If you don't, some of your non-story progress, including side quest completion, regalia upgrades, and hunts, will reset. I think this is almost comedic how incredibly fucked that is, but at least you have your warning. Unlike me. Everything in order? Yep. All right. Final Fantasy XV... You know, after giving it some thought, I think it is a good game. But it doesn't provide much reason to explore its open world outside of some genuinely cool combat encounters. And the only way to find them is by engaging in the unfortunately lacking open world itself. The setting wasn't as explained as I would have liked, but since the focus of the story was mostly between four specific characters, it was forgivable. Combat was flashy, though not what I would in any way call challenging, and the world would look good as a wallpaper. But if you're hoping for something especially interesting on a smaller level of detail, you might be disappointed. Seeing it referred to by the company that made it as a Final Fantasy for fans and first-timers, I can see that. I recommend it, though if you want a truly engaging open world or skill-based combat, this is not it. 
It was a fun time, but I honestly don't consider it among my favorite JRPGs. Twitch, Twitter, like, comment, subscribe. Next up is the future. Yeah, I'll see you later. Story out.